Right, there we are. Thank you very much. Kiel, um, a not uncommon place name in Argyle. Um, this map, which Fort William at the top and Oban at the bottom, there are four places, to my knowledge, they're called Kiel. Um, Ardnamuch, um, Ardgauer, Loch Arlen, Benderloch, and here, Dura. And it's this last one that I'm going to be talking about. Um, here, tucked into the policies, the grounds of Kiel House and the Kiel Farm, there is the remains of a ruined uh, late medieval chapel, and within it and around it, there are numerous burials. Um, you can see here, not very clearly, I'm afraid, because of the lighting. Um, this is the chapel, uh, Kiel, and it is a place name. Um, usually means that there has been some sort of ecclesiastical edifice there, usually a burial ground or church. And it also indicates uh, a dedication to St. Columba, um, the first abbot of Iona who died in 597 AD. But it's seven and a half centuries before we get any um, written reference to a church in Dura, when in 1354 the churches of Dura and Glencoe were um, gifted from John of Lorne to John of Isla. And this is a plan of what it looks like, um, late medieval with 20th century reconstruction, and uh, we're going to need some 21st century reconstruction on this wall as well. Um, it measures about 15, wait a moment, 12.3 by 5.6 meters, with the walls nine meters thick. At the east end of the long walls, there are windows with slab lintels and a small hole here on the north wall. On the south wall, another window, another hole, which you can hardly see. There must have been a beam across here at one time. I'm not sure what the purpose of that was. There's, there is no evidence of slots or holes for beams elsewhere. And at the bottom, a couple of ombres, little recesses for putting uh, various things during church services. And the floor is rather raised by a considerable number of burials. Um, it occurs on Timothy Pont's map of about 1590, Kill, Colm, Kill, uh, Kill, a church, Colm, Kill, that is Columba. Um, following the Battle of Culloden, Jacobite sympathies were not exterminated in this part of the world. It remained firmly Jacobite and Episcopalian. And the Ardshield estate was uh, forfeited to the crown. A factor was installed. This was Colin Campbell of Glenure, who was murdered uh, when he was riding through the wood at Lettermore between Balahulish and Cantalan on the 14th of May, 1752. The government panicked. They thought there was going to be another Jacobite uprising they arrested a leading member of the community, James Stewart, better known as James of the Glen, or Seamus of Glenny. Um, many books have been written about it, the most famous one being Robert Louis Stevenson's fictional book, Kidnapped. James was taken to Inverera, where he was tried and found guilty of being an asset, an, being an assistant, um, ah, I've forgotten the word, to the crime um, and were sentenced to death. This is usually reckoned as being one of the most vindictive, deliberately, uh, politically motivated miscarriages of justice in British history. James was hanged at Napahulish, just on the south side of the Balahulish Bridge, uh, at that time devoid of trees. His body was left hanging there for four years, so all could see it. Uh, eventually, his bones were gathered up and taken to Kiel, where he was uh, interred alongside um, the remains of his wife. And a plaque was set up in 1938 by James Stewart of Kiel, no relation as far as I'm aware. And one of uh, James of the Glen's descendants, Dun uh, Donald McCallum from Kerameas in the Okanagan Valley of British Columbia, Canada. 
Um, several books have been, as I said, have been written about the place. Um, this one, uh, Mary Ethel... Ah, that's much... <laughs> Mary Ethel Muir uh, Donaldson. I'll just go back so you can see the plaque a bit more clearly. Um, a romantic, small-c conservative spinster um, who took marvellous photographs, and here she is um, carrying around what she called Green Mariah, her little buggy with her, tele with her photographic equipment in it. She said in her book, um, Wanderings in the Western Highlands and Islands, published in 1921 and written while she was staying in Dura, both chapel and burial ground of Keel of Dura are small and of no interest. What old graven stones there may have been, having suffered such violence from weather and lack of care that their sculpturing has practically disappeared. Leap forward through 80 years, or very nearly 80 years, of further tempests. It hasn't been washed away by the sea yet, but that's going to come, I think, to Mary Myers, an archaeological uh, historian, in her book, The Western Seaford, sea Seaboard. The roofless ruin is now in sore need of consolidation. Yes, it is. In the surrounding burial ground, there are engraved 18th and 19th century slate tombstones of exceptional quality, especially those to the rear of the enclosure. Now, um, the oldest stone there is 1686. I think this is a piece of schist, but most of the stones, about 90% of them, are Balahulish slate. And uh, this weathers very well compared here with sandstone. I think this is 1826 and this is 1839. You can see how much better the slate has weathered compared with this sandstone. Um, early stones are all recumbent, that is flat on the ground. This is the second oldest one, 1766. What I would call a DIY engraving. The following year, another do-it-yourself one. And here we have Donald Buchanan. Um, they ran out of space and then forgot the A on the second line. But not all the early ones were quite as uh, amateurish as this. And when we get to the beginning of the 19th century, we start to see some really excellent stones. Um, over here, the whole length of it, uh, at the top, Somewhere there are, can't really make them out, but there are, oh, here we are over here on, on this one. Um, an hourglass and a coffin, symbols of mortality, and at the bottom, four lines of Gallic verse. Um, men, you who pass by overhead, look down behind you. Remember, I saw a time I was as fast as you, and then memento mori. Nearly everybody buried here must have spoken Gaelic, but it only occurs on three stones. One of them has the Gaelic for memento mori, cumlach ambas. Um, a couple of other um, recumbent stones. This one, again, more symbols of mortality, the inscription and the man's uh, profession, a huntsman. And then what is, I think, one of the most magnificent tombstones I've seen anywhere. I couldn't get up high enough to take a decent photograph, it, photograph of it myself, so I had to rely on photographing one of the Royal Commission's uh, publications. But at the top, Anno Domini, 1825, a winged soul, Vigilati Ora Venit, watch out, the hour is coming, and then eight children eight children who died before their parents. Two infants, um, no age or date given. I think they must have died very soon after birth. Three young children, um, no age or date given. And then three older ones. Alexander, who died on the 30th of January, 1822. Donald, who died on the 18th of December, 1822. He, Alexander was 28, Donald was 22, and Anne on the 21st of March, 1825, aged 20. And if you look at these carefully, you can see that the necklines of the shrouds on the two men differ from that of their sister. And also their shrouds only come down to their knees 
her hands come down and you can only just see the tips of her toes. And again, if you look carefully, you can see that the ends of Anne has uh, recessed. Uh, there must have been a mistake made and they had to uh, recarve it. And there are other bits on this stone where dates have had to be recarved. Um, a tragic story and I think a wonderfully intricate stone. And then we get on to the upright stones. This is the earliest one, 1809. Another sad story, he drowned aged 18. Uh, these stones have the inscription on the east facing side. So they're sheltered from the weather and the sunshine, the rain, the wind, which allows lichen to grow rather profusely. But in spite of this, you can still see the scribing lines to keep the letters on the right level. But it didn't work quite with the spacing. And Donald here has his final D up in the air. And we'll just go over some of the other upright stones. This one, you can see how the lichen has remained uh, in the inscription. Uh, it's a little bit more sheltered there. A rather simple stone. No idea who AJ was. Uh, fairly uh, simple stones and then a bit more decoration, still more decoration. These are the stones that Mary Myers thought so much of. And um, if we look at them, you can see the excellent of carving. The green color is due to algae. These were overhung by trees from outside the burial ground. And lichen couldn't grow because of the uh, shade, but uh, algae has managed to do so. And two more of them. You can see the excellence of the um, carvings. Um, and some of the decorations, uh, leaves, a flower, a cross. I think this person here, one of the people here, lived to be a 100. Um, a patriotic thistle, uh, a winged soul. This starburst and stars tells us that Mr. McCall here was a Freemason. Um, and someone must have loved Angus Livingston. Um, because down here, and five of his children who died young. Another sad story. There are lots of them. Uh, there's this obelisk. Uh, John McCall, poet, who died aged 36 in 1887. Um, quite a well-known Gaelic poet, I understand, and some of his poetry has been set to music and is still sung. I've recently come across but haven't met with someone who knows quite a lot about him, so I hope that in due course I'm going to learn rather more. And then there's this fairly substantial block of sandstone. Um, Mary McLaren, who died in 1870, and her son, Archibald Downey, who died in 1910. The name Mary McLaren rang a bell. She turns up in the 1861 census, living here in a buyer dwelling, along with her brother and sister-in-law, or possibly sister and brother-in-law, and one of their grandchildren. Uh, the living area is 15 feet by 15 feet, a doorway, no sign of windows, no smoke on the wall, so a central hearth, thatch, and a buyer next door. I think to go from this to this in a couple of generations, this family must have done very well, but just how they went up the scale, I don't know. And, uh, you know, the stones, I wish they could tell what stories they had. Um, and here are just some of the ones that come up with a question mark. This one, a sandstone slab, 155 centimeters by 25 to 35. And you can see there's an X here. It's in the wrong place to be a cross or a saltire. Is it a mason's mark? What's it doing? It's lying in north-south at the north corner of the church. This was only discovered because my wife tripped over it and laid it bare. Um, it's now covered by a rather more substantial uh, layer of turf to protect it. Um, this one, marvelous script here, Balahulish, I think it's the 26th of March, 1829, was it 39? And up here, a hand which might have been gloved and the figure two. Uh, this in memory of a child 10 days old. Um, what does this symbol mean? Five minutes. What? Five minutes. Oh, I'll have to hurry up. Okay. Um, this one, another McLaren, 
uh, skipper of the sloop Christian. I've searched the internet and can't find anything about a sloop called Christian. This quartz boulder, um, there are quite a few of them scattered around the churchyard. Is this a reversion to the pre-Christian habit of putting quartz pebbles um, at burial sites? I don't know. Uh, as I mentioned, um, the place was a bit of a jungle. Here it is two and a half years ago, a fallen tree, the chapel in the background, um, bramble thickets inside. James of the Glen's memorial plaque is in there. About 15 of us uh, got together one Saturday morning, two weeks later, and cleared it up. Well, some of them stopped for, uh, some of them, wait a minute, where are we going? Anyway, going the wrong direction. Some of them stopped for a bit of a blether, but others kept on working, and half of them escaped before I could get a group photograph, but here they, some of them are, and this lady who really kick-started this was delighted to find about two or three weeks later that this is where her ancestors lay. She was really thrilled about that. Once this had been done, we were able to map and record everything, uh, where the stones were, their size, what their inscriptions were. We've had help from Archaeology Scotland. Thank you, Cara, very much. That's what the entrance uh, used to be like, slippery slate steps. We've now got a handrail put up by my nephew, and a new gate, and an interpretation board. And then there's the McCall Stone. This is a story in itself, but Ian Don, uh, very uh, brown-haired John, John McCall, was the strongest man in the parish. And following a funeral and presumably a few drams, he challenged three people to put the stone on his back. They couldn't do so. So he picked it up in his arms and, as the story goes, ran nimbly barefoot up the slope and put it on the wall at the entrance to the graveyard. People were challenged to take it down. They couldn't. Most people couldn't lift it. I can move it, but I can't get air under it. It's that heavy. And there it lay until restoration work done in 1970s, when one of the workmen took it with him to Balahulish. And after some time, he needed a new pair of trousers. So he traded this stone for a pair of trousers, and it came to lie outside the hardware store in Balahulish. And the owner of this store is a friend of mine. I said, one day, I'm going to get some people from Dura in a dark, stormy night to come and repatriate the stone. He said, oh, don't bother. You can have it back when you can lift it. So friends came and lifted it into their van. It has now got as far as my garden. Eventually, it will get back. And we placed up on the top here, which is a rather interesting coffin rest with steps up on either side. And there, I think that's the old gate that has fallen down. And um, it will rest somewhere up on here. And this is Ian Don, John McCall's tombstone granite. Uh, he died aged 85 in 1866, I think. So there we are. Thank you very much, and you can now read all about it. It is now actually on the Archaeology Scotland website. I'm going to do a wee, wee bit of revision. There are one or two things which um, have come to light since uh, I told Cara about it originally. But thank you, Archaeology Scotland. Thank you, Fiona, for transcribing everything. Uh, am I on time? Yes, well That's bloody brilliant. brilliant.